Hello and welcome to Showcase. We're diving into Istanbul's old contemporary art, Donald Trump's architecture and Kenyan environmentalism. We'll revisit the Istanbul work of a famous contemporary artist from 100 years ago. We'll tell you how Donald Trump wants to make architecture beautiful again. And we look at how this Kenyan welder's artwork is saving his country's wildlife. Alexis Grichenko was a maverick artist based in Moscow. He was famous, he was contemporary for his time. And then this little thing called the Bolshevik Revolution happened. That's when Grichenko came to Istanbul and things for him started to change. What exactly? We'll talk about that in a moment with an art historian. But first, here is Senna. Alexis Grichenko was already a well-rounded artist, an art theorist, an expert on iconography by the time he came to Istanbul. He wrote hundreds of pages here and later published his notes as a book called Two Years in Constantinople. He was a keen observer, a visionary from Moscow, where he had to escape soon after the Bolshevik Revolution. He arrived in Istanbul as a refugee, a strange man in a strange land with much to share. Alexis Grichenko was influenced by Cubism and Futurism. These are early 20th century art movements. And when he came to Istanbul in 1919, he found the city under occupation. But he was still pretty much influenced by the colors and movements that he found in the bazaars, mosques and streets of Istanbul. His unique style was called Dynamo Color. To see what's it like, check out his self-portrait. See the boxy forms and architectural lines. This is him in a cubist style, not mimicking his true appearance, but seeing himself in a new light. And this here is a portrait of Grichenko in Istanbul, painted by his close friend, Namık Ismail. So you get the idea. This is how Dynamo Color gives him a unique vision when he painted everyday life in the city, the fishermen, the coffee shops, the women in their colorful clothes. Grichenko will show Istanbulites, all the people who once visited Istanbul, the colors and forms that are hidden in the details of the city. Therefore, these cubic structures in Istanbul, whether it be city walls or mosques, the artist notices them much better than us. He sees Istanbul with fresh eyes and shows us that view. And today, the Meshar Gallery's exhibition in Istanbul has retraced Grichenko's steps. Remember Namık Ismail? This was his wife, Münire. And art historian Ayşe Nurgüler has seen this portrait, has known about this portrait, but when she found out about the photograph, she got very excited. In the photograph, there's a detail of the, of the camel, uh, which uh, Grichenko describes in his memoirs, and it matches the photograph. So we have uh, the photograph, the memoir, the painting, uh, everything's coming together and these are all traces of Grichenko we can find in Istanbul, his, tracing his footsteps. Uh, so it, we, and as art historians, we don't always get this lucky. Another close friend to him was Ibrahim Çalı. Together they explored the Mevlevi Hanes, the place where Turkey's whirling dervishes practiced. In this part of the exhibition, you can see Grichenko and Çalı next to each other. Along with Namık Ismail, Çalı was in a group of artists known as the 1914 Generation. They were one of the first painters who brought contemporary trends to Turkish art scene. This is actually a very important example of interaction we can still learn from today. It's very important for a painter who came to Istanbul as a refugee from Moscow to establish a life here, to make friends with the painters here, to be inspired by them, to reflect this relationship in his works and to affect their style as well. So take that, social media. With no LinkedIn, no couch surfing. Grichenko came to Istanbul amidst a revolution and built relationships that influenced his work, more than any influencer could today. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Art historian Ayşe Nurgüler, who we saw in Sena's story, joins me now. Thank you so much for coming on our set. Thank so, you for having um, me. 
So when I look at the avant-garde milieu from the Russian Empire, when I think of, for example, I mean, Shevchenko's, Shevchenko's primitivism or um, Kandinsky's expressionism, these are all, uh, you know, brands almost in art history. But then Grichenko and uh, Color Dynamo, what, I mean, do you feel like it's kind of underrated? Well, Grichenko made a conscious decision to leave the Russian Empire when the civil war was going on. So he had to leave behind all his works, his students, and Dinoma Kohler le you know, was left without a father almost. So, and after he left the Russian Empire, none of his students became uh, you know, prominent names in the art history world. So uh, we could say that it was, Dinamo Kohler was underrated. Mm -hmm. But does this mean that it was unimportant? Uh, I wouldn't say that, but he came to Istanbul and his inspired, he was inspired by Istanbul and his Istanbul-themed works. Uh, with those works, he was able to be, become a name uh, in France, in Paris. So uh, he did have more of a solo story uh, after he left the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. And... Um I mean, so I'm kind of struggling with the wording here, forgive my ignorance, but yeah. mm -hmm. he is not a Russian artist, but a Ukrainian. How should I name him? Is he a Ukrainian artist? And uh, what is the difference, really? He, he's, uh, he's a painter from northern Ukraine. He was born in Kroveletz. And uh, during his lifetime, uh, you know, he made the special request that all of his... He, he founded a foundation and he requested that once Ukraine became independent, all these works uh, that were uh, in the foundation would be transferred to uh, Ukrainian uh, National uh, Museum of Ukraine. So, uh, and Ukraine has a different culture, different language. And our, uh, my collaborator, Grichanko expert, Vita Susak, was keen on, you know, presenting Grichanko as a Ukrainian painter. Mm -hmm. So... Ukrainian painter, full stop. Because as I was uh, as I was comparing him to Kandinsky and Malevich, and I don't know, uh, Malevich was also born in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. born in Ukraine, and uh, so was Tatlin. So yes, uh, okay. there's an effort uh, to redefine, you know, mm -hmm. or reclaim Ukraine's history of art and its contribution to history of art. And I think identity is kind of tricky for, uh, for his journey because obviously he left Moscow in 1919 mm -hmm. and then he came to Istanbul and then he moved on to Europe from here. So how yeah. do you think this journey, this, uh, this sort of traveling between the countries and identities and stories sort of influenced his art? Well, he, well... Uh, he became famous with these Istanbul-themed works. So I think his first stop was his dream. He, he says this in his memoirs uh, as well. Uh, and with these works, he became famous. And he kept on traveling. So obviously, probably he saw interacting with different cultures, different peoples, uh, and seeing, you know, different places have helped him, you know, uh, you know, carry on uh, and find his, uh, mm. you know, uh, artistic style. But Aisha, did why did he leave Istanbul? It's interesting. Uh, he wants to leave Istanbul. He, you know, there are many other uh, painters from the Russian Empire at the time. He's not the only one. We know Dmitry Smilovich was here and other Russian, uh, you know, uh, painters uh, have formed, uh, you know, groups. Uh, and they have exhibited their works, but Grichenko uh, prefers uh, to spend time with the Turkish artists and with the locals, and he never exhibits his works in Istanbul when he stays here, and uh, he only shows his works to a close group of friends or potential buyers. Mm -hmm. So we sort of have this hint that uh, he wants to take all his works and bring them to Western Europe and uh, to Paris, uh, mm -hmm. actually. And, and that's what he does. So how, how would his art be shaped if he never left Istanbul? Uh, I would say it's hard to define. I mean, it's hard to say, I believe. Uh, he makes a conscious decision to leave Istanbul and he never comes back here. 
But uh, the life he witnessed was, uh, you know, the last remnants of an empire. And, you know, he was fascinated with the Eastern uh, style, Eastern lifestyle. He was fascinated with the, uh, you know, Byzantine heritage. Um, uh, it's, I, I, I'd say it's hard to say. It's, it's, it's hard to say. And, and also, maybe a better question is how his art would be shaped if he never stepped foot in Istanbul. Um, yeah, well, maybe he would have stayed in, in Moscow and he would have carried on with his, uh, you know, students and his art theory. Uh, and who knows? I mean, uh, but I still believe he would have made a name because he's not only a good painter, he's also a great narrator and he's been the author of many memoirs. So, I mean, I think he was destined to leave a footprint in this world. Mm -hmm. Ayşe Günür Güler, good to have you on our show today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Growing up in Kenya's Rift Valley, Kiyoki Mivitiki never thought he'd become a famous artist. But his concerns about wildlife conservation took the Kenyan sculptor's life in a direction that he could never have imagined. Mutiki says he became an artist by accident. His university expelled him for taking part in anti-government protests. So he took an apprenticeship at a welding shop in Nairobi. In his free time, he began welding together objects out of recycled materials. Uh, recycling now has become um, a very important issue because, uh, I mean, you just need to be really in sync with what is happening. All this plastic in the air, all this plastic in the, in the ocean, and also the whole idea of Africa being in a very unique place. We, we are on the receiving end of, of a lot of pollution in the world. But Mutiki was shocked when he saw his metal animals displayed in the window of a Nairobi art gallery. A broker bought them from him cheaply and sold them for a fortune. Mutiki realized that his objects were works of art that could draw attention to an issue that lies very close to his heart. Nature conservation. Besides pieces of scrap metal, Mutiki transforms animal snares used by illegal hunters to create manes for his lion sculptures. I, I grew up in an area where the migration was coming through, the wildebeest migration, in a place called uh, Kajiado. Uh, that part of the migration does not exist anymore because if you study migration patterns, uh, there was a pattern that used to go up north from uh, Tanzania to Namanga through Kajiado back into the Mara. Those migration routes have largely disappeared due to hunting and human encroachment on animal habitats. Today, Mutiki owns his own art gallery in Nairobi and with the hope that he might spread his message of conservation, he has started training aspiring artists in his craft. And now for a quick look at some of the stories from the world of the arts and culture. The Louvre Museum is giving 30,000 more people a chance to see its Leonardo da Vinci exhibition before it closes. The event, honoring the 500th anniversary of the artist's death, is sold out. But the museum is keeping the exhibit open during the schedule's final three nights. And those tickets will be free. The art of Banksy is now in London without the artist's permission. 80 authenticated Banksy artworks will be a part of the exhibition, curated by Banksy's former agent, Steve Lazaritas. Just like previous exhibitions, Banksy has no affiliation with the show. A critic accidentally destroyed a piece of art at Mexico's Zona Moca Art Fair. The contemporary piece consisted of a sheet of glass and several random objects. They were shattered after Avelina Lesper placed an empty drink can next to it. 
Lesper later said it wasn't intentional, but she also wouldn't deny that she didn't like the piece. The Museum of London's Docklands Gallery is set to open a bronze exhibition. More than 450 objects will be on display, all of which were excavated near the city in 2018. Experts say it's the biggest discovery of its kind in the area and one of the largest in the country. The artifacts are believed to be as old as 3,000 years. U.S. President Donald Trump wants to make federal buildings beautiful again. It might sound like his 2016 campaign slogan, but this time it's the name of a draft executive order, and architects are upset. If applied, it would require that new federal buildings be made in a classical style, similar to the White House or Capitol Hill. The order would also undo rules put in place by President John F. Kennedy, which allowed architects to consider contemporary and modern designs when proposing new federal buildings. Some architects criticized such an order as undemocratic. Sydney Franklin is here with me. She is the associate editor of the Architects newspaper. So, Sydney, how likely will this order actually happen? Well, I would say it's fairly likely if President Trump um, gets reelected in the coming year. As you know, our elections are coming up this November. So I could definitely see him pulling out a stop and throwing out this executive order um, as a call uh, to, you know, set his status as um, the big man in the White House. Of course, if a Democratic president comes in, um, they could just sweep it out. So I see it ha as happening, but there's it's too soon to tell, I think. Because, I mean, he's been leaning uh, towards classicism, right, uh, since he came into power. Why does he believe that classicism is the right style and why is he opposed to modernism so much in architecture? Well, it's funny, if you've ever visited um, a Trump hotel or one of his major developments, the exterior is modern, however, the interior does have kind of a grandiose style to it that maybe alludes to a former... Um, more king-like classical era. However, I see his move to make classicism the style on the exterior as well as kind of an authoritative move. Um, it's no secret that he has long hated uh, brutalism or deconstructivism. He's had quite the feud with a building in Washington, D.C., um, the FBI building. It's downtown, uh, the J. Edgar Hoover building, and it is not attractive. Mm -hmm. However, that has probably spurred on his hate for all things brutalism, um, as well as the deconstructivist style, which honestly has its own issues. However, I could see him just wanting to uh, say that the classicist style is beautiful, it leans European, that's where we come from, therefore, um, America is morally su superior, yeah. just like Europe. Okay, Sydney, so you said that the constructivist and uh, brutalist buildings have their own issues as well. Trump, for example, mm. thinks that they don't embody the country's self-governing ideals, these buildings. Do you agree with that? I don't. I, I do agree that our more classicist buildings in the United States are beautiful, um, especially in Washington, D.C. However, the mandate that came from the General Services Administration's guiding principles of architecture was to design buildings of their time and place. So all the other federal buildings you've seen built since the 1960s have taken on um, styles that resonate with their setting, whether that's in Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, et cetera, or, um, you know, the time, the era. And right now we're in a very contemporary, glass-heavy aesthetic of architecture. Okay, just to clear it out for everyone, how do you think federal buildings should look like? They should be welcoming. They should be full of light. They should include ample public space inside and outside. And they should also be easy to navigate. I'll say that many federal buildings that Trump likes are difficult to, to walk through. You have to be able to have worked there for many, many years to be able to get through 
the city hall in New York City. I can't even imagine what it's like walking inside the White House. <laughs> so, um, yes, anything that is easy for anyone of any background to feel as though they are welcomed into the United States or to a city, that's what a good federal mm -hmm. building is. Okay, Sydney, it's interesting because National Civic Arts Society, the NGO that spearheaded this order, say that the modern uh, aesthetic is degraded and dehumanizing. Do you agree with that? No, not at all. Um, again, if they think that the modern aesthetic, which is full of light and uses, now we're trying to use more sustainable materials uh, like glass curtain walls to bring in ample daylight while decreasing the carbon footprint. Um, I don't see how humans deserve, don't deserve mm. a light filled structure. So again, like I said, some of these older neoclassical and classical building, buildings in the United States don't have very many windows and I yeah. wouldn't want to be in them as beautiful as they are. Well, Sydney, it's interesting that you're actually focusing on human experience a lot because mm -hmm. uh, Marion Smith, this group's chairman, said something that really I uh, found interesting. He, she said that the order gives voice to the 99% who do not like what our government has been building. So do we actually know what the American public wants and do we have any sort of uh, statistics on this? Not that I know of, but I would say again, from city to city, uh, the federal buildings that have been built under the GSA have been created um, using public input. That is part of the mandate. These are taxpayer funded government structures. And so these architects are chosen, they give their proposals, and then the community is allowed to weigh in on the design at the end of the day. Okay. so. Before we wrap up, one last question, which is uh, really important for me to understand this. Who has the say? Is it the architects, the public or the authorities when it comes to the aesthetics of a building that will be used by people? In a democratic country, I want to say that people have to say at the end of the day, but I live in New York and that's not always the case. Um, it is usually developers and Trump is a developer and if he puts this executive order in place, he can get what he wants. However, it has been outlined that though classical architecture will be the preferred and default style, there can be a case for arguing against it if there's a special circumstance. So we'll see if that ever works out. So you find this act dictatorial then? Yes, absolutely. Hitler and Stalin have pulled the same situation back in the day. Well, okay, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Sydney Franklin, good to have you on our show today. Thanks so much for bringing in your expertise on this. Anti-government protests in Lebanon are in full swing, and it doesn't seem like they'll end anytime soon. But at the center of the chaos, surrounded by barbed wire and blast walls, artists are trying to send a message of hope. Rula Abdo and others like her have been painting murals on these blast walls ever since anti-government protests erupted in the country in October. I've been putting my ideas in these drawings, hoping that such an action would affect the people who see it on the street, and that through art there will be a dialogue among them, and maybe my art would encourage and give them the motive to stay on the street and to remind them of why they are in this revolution and why we took to the street. The Lebanese are divided over whether to continue demonstrations or give the new cabinet a chance as the country faces its most dire economic crisis in decades. The peaceful demonstrations have turned violent and security measures have prevented protesters from reaching parliament. But Abdo and her fellow artists remain defiant. I drew two hands trying to make an opening in the walls and named it We Shall Pass to motivate people and give them hope that we are still here, we did not go anywhere. And if we stay strong, we will open these walls and be able to go back to the squares that are originally ours. And for the protesters, the graffiti is a form of therapy. This is a wall of shame and we are writing on it whatever we feel. 
It absorbs our anger which is better than smashing it and destroying everything, better than killing ourselves. Eventually, we have nothing left to lose. But on Tuesday, protesters once again clashed with security forces. No one knows what will happen. But maybe the government should read the writing on the wall. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.